Right, welcome to Derek's second lecture on algorithms for finitely presented groups. Okay, thank you. So let's just quickly summarize what I did in the first lecture. What the, the series of lectures is about algorithms and computation in groups defined by a finite presentation. So that's just notation. My, my group G is defined by a finite generating set X and a finite set of relators R. Then A is X would be an X inverse set, just the alphabet over which we write the elements of the group. Now, the first thing we did was we considered various types of algorithms for computing various types of quotients of G. So the abelian quotients, which we did in some detail and mentioned other important applications in this direction. Quotients of the plan power order, no quotients of polycyclic quotients. So that I didn't say much about those, I just mentioned their existence. Then the main thing we did was the coset enumeration algorithms you taught in Coxeter. So here we have a subgroup where, where, as part of the input, we're given a subgroup H of G defined by a finite, Y is finite to the finite generating set. And what happens here is that if the index is finite of H to G, then coset enumeration, this method, will work and it will compute the permutation action of G on the right cosets of H. So if of course, the problem of whether H is finite in general is undecidable, so it won't work if, in fact, it will just run forever if the index is infinite. It might also run forever if the, or appear to run forever if the index is very large or if it's a very difficult presentation of the trivial group. So, there are examples where H equals G and it will run arbitrarily wrong. There's no, there are no kind of recursive bounds you can put in, in terms of the input. Okay, so and then I mentioned some, again, without any details, but uh, related algorithms. We could compute all subgroups of G up to a given index. That's a sort of converse, find all the subgroups. Another thing we could do is we could find a presentation of a given finite group with, of which we know, already know the order and the effectively the complete multiplication table. <laughs> so they're the things we've discussed. Now, this Today's talk is kind of divided into two halves, dealing with two different topics. So the first half is another thing that's closely related to coset enumeration, or to coset tables anyway, which is finding presentations of subgroups. So suppose we're in exa exactly in that situation, and you say, OK, I've, I've worked out H has index 25 and G. Now I'd like a presentation of the subgroup H, please. And so there's a nice algorithm for doing that, which I thought I'd tell you about first. Uh, with a, so that's called the Leibniz Schreier algorithm. So let's, let me first very quickly run over the theory of this whole process. The theory works for, the index doesn't have to be finite. So for the theory, the presentation for the index don't need to be finite. So the general setup, just as usual, G is defined like that. So it's a quotient of a free group by the normal closure of the relators. So we've got a subgroup. Now the subgroup is, is it, the subgroup H of G is the inverse image. So it's inverse image we'll call E, the inverse image of the free group. So that's a E over N. And what we need for this approach is a, is a transversal. So again, that's why in practice we're restricted to finite index because we need the transversal to be Finite. So we're working here with generally with right action. So we'll use a right transversal, and let's call that T. So what I call T tilde the kind of inverse image of the transversal. So they're the words in F and and the T the transversion for H and G. And a little bit. Of, so we'll assume it's convenient to assume the identity is part of the trans. That makes one or two things work out easier. And a little bit of notation for. An arbitrary element of the free group, I'll find W bar, that's probably not the most wonderful notation I've ever had. I mean, W bar is not the image of W in the quotient group, it's the transversal element uh, for which uh, 
or it's our chosen transversal element in which W lies. I think that should have been a T tilde actually. Okay, basically it doesn't it doesn't matter much. Okay, so so W bar is not the image in the quotient, it's the it's the it's the coset representative of W. And now we have the theorem which tells us the generate so this gives us what's called a generating set of H, which is generally not the generating set we started with. It's uh, typically a slightly larger generating set whose size is roughly the size of the transversal times uh, times the original generator. So, it, so it's bigger by a factor of the index. And so what we do, we take all the transversal elements T, we multi multiply them by all the generators in X, getting Tx, and then, then we look at the coset representative of Tx, and multiply by the inverse of that, so that of course brings us back into the subgroup because we multiply Tx by the inverse of its coset representative. And there's a, there's a moderately, an optically difficult theorem that, you know, some sort of proof there's half a page, that that set Y generates, uh, in this case, uh, I get confused whether I'm working in, yeah, so that set Y generates E, I tend to get confused whether I'm working in E or X image. Okay, so a, a slight, a somewhat deeper theorem is that if this is the Nielsen Schreier theorem that a subgroup of a three group is free, if provided that T is closed under prefixes, you see T is, that's why I want to regard T as a, a city of E, because then, then it's elements of words and we can talk about it. So in other words, if we choose X, Y, X as a transversal element, then we, then we must choose X, Y and X and the identity also. So that's what prefix close means, so the, any prefix of a closed representative must itself be in it. And then it, it, with that extra assumption, then E is a, actually a free group, and it's freely generated by this set Y. So where you take the non-trivial elements. So, okay, so then the generator... Always, uh, yeah. Sorry. It's always a free group, but in this case, this is a basis form. Yeah, I mean, it's always, this is always a basis form. Yeah, this is, this is what the proofs, I mean, the Schreier proof that the subgroups of free groups are free produces this basis. I mean, the topological proofs are slicker, but if you, you it, I mean, the, to, the topological proofs of this theorem are sort of quicker, but if you, but they don't give you the basis, and if you say, okay, I'd like the free basis, then you come up with this again. And um, Nielsen, Nielsen's proofs are a bit different. Nielsen, you, you start with a subset of E, and use the subset to calculate a free basis. But anyway, but there, this, this is the one I want to use for, so this is what we're going to use for, the, this Y is what we're going to use for our generating set in our presentation of the subgroup H. Okay, so now the Leidemeister Schreier theorem, which is what this theory depends on, again, is that, so we need relators to get H, and so what we do, we take, we start with the relators of G, which W, so W is one of our defining relators of G, so that's in the set, in the normal subgroup N. And of course N is a normal subgroup. And so for each transversal element T, TWT inverse, is also going to be in the normal subgroup. Uh, but that's left as it is. TWT inverse is a normal, will be an element, a word in the, in the free group on X. So it will be a word, it will be a word in, in A. And what we want but we, we, what we want, we, we need to rewrite it as a word in Y to get the presentation of H. So that's where this isomorphism rho comes in. Now, the good thing about this algorithm, so we, you might think, how are we going to calculate rho? It, it's, it's one of those algorithms, it's, it's in some sense easier to do than it is to explain. And it's, this is, that's why I'm giving an example of this, because it's, it's actually very mechanical and straightforward to do in practice, uh, explaining it and writing down the formal proof. If you want a really formal proof, go to the book by Charlie Sims. And if you want ha hand wavy proofs, go to one of my, probably my book. Or the, oh, no, I think, no, actually, I think the, the handbook of computational proof theory really has a reasonably formal proof of this. Anyway, so, okay, so how does it work? Well, we, we start with a cosec table, so it's, it's convenient. 
It's not necessary. It's convenient to do this when we just found a coset of numeration. But so, it's, in other words, a coset table is just the permutation representation of the right coset. So that's what we start with. And okay, so I'm just going to do an example to illustrate how we do it. And usually I take a nice baby example. So G is going to be two generator group relations x cubed y to the fourth x y squared. This is any of you who don't know much about this will know that's the symmetric group S4, group of order 24. And the subgroup I'm taking is generated by x and by y x inverse y to the minus 2, which in fact has index 4 in G. And okay, so I explained how to do coset enumeration last time, so let's suppose we've done our coset enumeration. And so the underlined numbers are the definitions. Okay, so 1 under y is 2, 2 under x is 3, and 2 under y is 4. And they, the definitions give you, uh, and if, if you haven't used coset enumeration, you can, you, can, um, you, you can decide which are definitions retrospectively. As long as, as, long as you kind of do your underlines in a sensible order, you'll end up with a Schreier transversal. It's important you end up with a Schreier transversal, which means prefix closed. So maybe I'll, oh, at least this is in fact what we've got. So let me just write these up. So one, these are the coset representatives. One is one, two is y, three is yx. That's just so I don't have to flip back. The four is y squared. So that's our, that's our triad transversal. And you can see it's prefix closed. We've got y, x, so therefore we must have y. And I say by, by doing the definitions in a sensible order, it comes out that way. Okay, so that's, that, that's the set y. Uh, no, sorry, it's not the set y, that's the set of, tra that, of transversal elements. We come now to working out the set y, so how do we do that? Well, there's a nice, simple, algorithmic way of doing that for each. We then look at the first two columns, this, the inverses are sort of consequences, and any, any letter, and so in the first two columns, any number, any entry that is not underlined will stick a letter in front of example, A, B, C, D, E. And in fact, these letters are exactly the triad generators. So, so we're now thinking, in the coset table, 3x is 4, but now, in terms of transversal elements, what we're saying is y x times x is it, so yeah y x that's that's three times x is b times four. So so if you wanted to, I, so for example, b we can work, we can work out what they actually are. It's actually y y x times x times the times the inverse of 4, which is y to the minus 2. So that's 3x, 4, 4 inverse, if you like. So, so these a, b, c, d, and d are exactly the triad generators. And you see I've, I've, I've stuck their inverses in. So you now, we're sort of reinterpreting this table. Previously we thought of the numbers as representing cosets. And now they now they they have a bit more information. They now the numbers represent transversal elements, and the and, and the letters A B C D E are the elements of the subgroup which make the table correct. Okay, so we've got our triad generators. Now, okay, yeah. So I, so I think that out. So Y is A B C D E with, um, and of course these are these are generators of the three. Of the underlying three group, and they're the triad generators. So, as I said, b is y times x squared times y to the minus two. But to carry out the algorithm, you don't actually need to know what a, b, c, d, and d are. You would need to know that if you wanted to interpret them back in the original group. Okay, so what do we do? So remember, we've got to calculate. We've got to calculate these row. Remember, the relators are row. T, W, T inverse, where T is a transversal element, 
help you as a relator and see him thus. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, it, it's actually very easy. We, what's called, we scan the, we scan the relator, the relators for each coset. So, uh, so one x is a times one. Uh, one x a times one times x is a squared times one. A squared one times x is a cubed times one. So we've now got one times x cubed is a cubed times one. So a cubed is a relator. And in fact it is precisely, in fact it's the relator corresponding to t being the identity, w being x cubed. And, and then the second one is, where two, so that, so that, that second row of the table is the case where t is y, so, so the set, so, so, so in the second row of that say we're looking at y times x cubed times, and, and the conclusion is it's bd times y, so y x cubed y inverse equals bd. So, so the bd there is precisely this rewrite of y x cubed y inverse, and uh, and so what well, I mean, it's somehow easier to do this. Uh, I say I'm a cynical. I lecture, I, I lecture on this topic. Well, that's an advanced group theory lecture course, but I suspect uh, half the students taking the course don't really understand this process. But you you, you can teach them how to do it, and so. You, with luck, you can teach them to get the answer right. Okay. <laughs> no, sorry, I, 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 one gets more cynical as one. Okay, you may be wondering why, why have I not. Uh, I should also have put those for three and four. But the reason I didn't do that was if I. Well, let's see, if we'd started on three, we'd have got B, and then we'd have got BD, and then we'd have got B back, back, back again. If we started on four, we would have got. Start on four, we, yeah, so let's, let's just look at that. So, the start on two gave, gave us uh, BD, the start on three would give us BD, the start on four would, would give us slightly different answer, would give us DB. But that's, but that's still a cyclic shift of this, so we, so we, don't, we don't need either of those because they're, they're, they're cyclic shifts of. Uh, but this is this, this is a useful trick for not doing any more work than you need to, particularly if you've got whatever you've got the latest like proper powers, you can do this trick. Okay, so now we, we need to do the same with the other relators. So for the white's the fourth, we, we do we do it better. We only need that's a four cycle of the cosets, so we only need to do it once and we get E, and then we get we get E there, and then we get E C. And uh, x y x y. Unfortunately, we have to do we have to do three. See if we the, the first we, we don't have to do it for two because that will give us the same result. That will give us C A again. But uh, we do have to do it for three and four. And now you see we've got one two three six relators. So that, now we have finished. Now we've got our presentation. So H. Is isomorphic to A, B, C, D, E, and with these five relators that we've just calculated. And now, one of the disadvantages, the, the advantage of this method is it's, it's somehow very mechanical, very quick and easy to do. A disadvantage, if you're if you're working with subgroups of index 50,000, 100,000, that's the problem with this topic is that you, you get this nice algorithm and then suddenly somebody unreasonably wants to do it with a subgroup of index 100,000. And, uh, you say you've got 500,000 generators and, uh, uh, and about 5 million relators. And, and you immediately discover them. Well, firstly, you get a lot of repetition, but you, you can eliminate, but, huge numbers of these without much difficulty. So this is where tips of transformations come in, which I mentioned in the first lecture. So we've got a relation BD. BD is a relator, that means D equals B inverse. So we, we can eliminate D because it's B inverse. 
Then we can eliminate E because it's C inverse. Then we can eliminate C because it's A inverse. So that, that, that's as far as we could go. We're down to A and B and the, with three relations. So of the six relations, three of them are being used to eliminate generators. And this is a bit like, so this is just like solving equations. So we're left with three. And we've got a cubed b a squared b squared, which is a very familiar presentation of the dihedral group. So, so we've got a sub, we, we, in fact, we've now proved this group is of order 24, if we could know already, in fact, we, so we proved it's got a subgroup of index 4 in isomorphic to S3, uh, and, uh, and the permutation action is unity of S4, so we proved it's S4. Okay, so. Question. Yeah. So these Tietze transformations, can could you do them during the algorithm to compute the permutation? So if I find the relator B times D, you I could. would just say okay, or with D, because that's the inverse of D. Yeah? You could, yes. Is this uh, done in practice? Uh, I think it's been I think it's been tried, yes. Uh, but there are various there are various hybrid I think, I mean let, let me I, I think it's more popular to do something intermediate. Let, let me, you see, there's, a, there's another approach to this, which I'm not going to talk about in detail because it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's more complicated. You, you might say that that wasn't what I wanted. I, I gave, I gave you generators of this subgroup H, and I, I want my presentation on the generators that I gave you. You could be a completely different generator set. That's not what I want to. So uh, that can be done as well. It's slightly more complicated. It, to do that, you have to do the, this calculate. This is it's the same calculation, but you have to do it while you're doing the process enumeration. You don't. You can't do it so easily retrospectively. You have to do it at the same time. But it has the it has the big disadvantage that um, when the index is large. The relators start getting impossibly long. Uh, and that, I mean, that's the, in a sense, that's the same, it's a similar problem with what you suggest, Calvin. That if, if you keep eliminating, when you do this with, a, with, with your presentation on 100,000 generators and 5 million relations, you, it, it all goes fine. In fact, typically you'll, you'll get it down to maybe 100 generators without much trouble. But then, then the relations, will suddenly start to get longer and longer. Every elimination will double the length of the relations. And if you do this, on, this works fine on small index. If you try and do it on big index, you'll get enormous uh, lengths. And so people, I mean, I know what has been tr tried. It, 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 so they used to, I, don't, I think that might have the option. It's to do a kind of intermediate thing where you, uh, you sort of use the user supply generators, but when they start getting too, when the relators start getting too long, you, you, when you're sort of using straight line programs, you stop expanding them in full. So you're, well, my experience is when you do, I, 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 not recently, I've experimented quite a lot with this, and I found the time it took was almost, the time it takes when you do the user supply generators and introduce new generators, You'll end up with something on a hundred generators, and if, and if you do if you do it the other way, you you, you do this better than you start with hundred thousand generators and eliminate. You'll you'll end up with more or less the same hundred generators. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, although it should be said in this case, the, the the order in which you do the elimination can make a huge difference. So uh, that, and there's there are heuristics, but again, there's no. Uh, uh, that's perhaps the most interesting part of this topic. That you, you know, you know, you you get the you do the teacher of transformations in the right order, and everything crashes. Everything comes down to a beautiful presentation. You do it different, slightly differently, and everything blows up. Okay, so so okay, so I've, more than that, I've given you the easy version of the Ryan master trial, and I say the user supply generators. It's essentially the same thing, except you do it while you're doing the concept enumeration rather than retrospectively. And of course, then, then you, if you do, when you do that, you have to deal with coincidences and awkward things like that. So coincidences will give you extra relation, extra subgroup relations, typically. Okay, so, 
just to finish off this kind of part of the topic, there's a, a very, there's a familiar application of this. This is where, this is actually where the big indices often come in. One, one of the most fundamental problems in finite if we said if group is this, this group finite or not, and uh, Abel <coughs> yesterday gave you a difficult example of this, a challenge example. And the, across the years I've, I've <coughs> encountered a, a large number of challenge examples of this. And there are various ways, okay, so if, to prove a finite, prove a group's finite, you'll typically use coset enumeration. You'll, you'll, find, you'll try and find a nice subgroup Prove it's got finite index, and then try and prove the subgroup finite. So, but, to prove, but how do we prove it infinite? Well, there, there are various ways. Uh, one, one method is, uh, which I'll be talking about in the third lecture is involving what's called automatic groups. So we'll come to that. But maybe the oldest method is the following: is is using a combination of the things I've spoken about, uh, subgroup presentations, and uh, and the million invariants. So let me just tell you quickly about that. So the most obvious thing, you, you do this before you do anything else, you compute the abelian invariants of G, because that's easy. And maybe if uh, maybe maybe one of them's infinite, in that case you're done, but usually they're not. So what do we do next? Well we find some subgroups of low index and the Obviously, the low index subgroup algorithm is useful for that purpose. Or you might have other means of, sometimes there are other means of finding nice subgroups of low index. Then you use the Rider Schreier, Master Schreier on those to find presentations. Then you compute the abelian invariance of those presentations. So, if you've got a subgroup that's, if you've got an infinite subgroup, then the original group has a, that's a bit infinite. So, if you, if you find a subgroup, with an infinite abelian invariant, then you prove G is infinite. And <coughs> this, ha this, has, this method has some other sort of applications. It's connected with the, some way of Pascal, uh, with this T conjecture or whatever it is. So, uh, so, so the, the, it, it's, it's got applications outside of it's in addition to the immediate aim of proving G infinite. But, but coming out this, it has some, it has in some examples been necessary to go up to subgroups of big index in order to get the infinite abelian invariance. Okay, so here's a, well, a baby example. Um, supposing I wanted to prove this, this group, x cubed, y cubed, x, y cubed, infinite, it is, it is indeed infinite. You'd find the abelian invariants, you can almost do those in your head, of G are 3 and 3. So that's finite, that's no good, but we very easily find a subgroup. X and, this, is, this is literally the easiest example of this I could come up with. X inverse Y, Y X inverse, maybe you put a diagonal for what you need. But uh, that's got index 3, and you if you calculate a presentation of H, you'll find it's got abelian invariance zero and zero, which means that uh, zero, abelian invariance zero is our uh, is the standard way of leaving infinity. So zero, well, it's like it means so the group is dead over zero times dead, so it's infinite cyclic. Yeah, uh, and in some ways it's, it's not. In fact, they, uh, H is actually at Z squared itself in that example, so maybe it won't make that so slightly crude example. I mean, you'll find the, the presentation of H will, will actually just be two generators that commute. <coughs> That's what's called a Euclidean cops of the group, or an affine cops of the group. Okay, so, yeah, so I think in a sense that ends, I, I've given three lectures, but the, in fact, but the, the, the topics divide more naturally into ha two halves rather than Three thirds. So I've kind of been half, halfway through. I've sort of finished the first half of the talk. The first half has been basically you could sum it all up as calculating various types of quotients of a finite representative groups. We, we, we started off with easy ones of being group heap quotients. But even coset enumeration, you, you could envisage that what you could say what we're actually doing is we're finding finite quotients because we're finding homomorphisms on to SM. 
which as a homomorphism is equivalent to S n is equivalent to a finite quotient of Q. So now re remember that from the beginning, we got the fundamental difficulty in this topic that all the pro all the natural problems are unsolvable. That is to put G trivial, is it infinite, undecidable, or whatever. So I think I said, I said in the last lecture there are two ways we could hope to continue. The first was to look at quotients rather than looking at the whole group. Uh, if we do want to look at the whole group, we want to solve the world problem and so on, then we're going to have to restrict the class of groups which we look at. So, yeah, so, so if you like, the rest of this course will be about trying to solve the fundamental problems like the word, maybe the word problem actually, and also the conjugacy, isomorphism problems. I won't, I, won't, I won't be saying that, you know, I've probably been very, saying very little about the conjugacy and isomorphism. So, but if we want to do that, we've got to restrict ourselves to particular classes of groups, groups with nice properties for which we know we can do this. I mean, we don't, we don't have to know in advance that the group has this property, but that the, that's the advantage that we can, we, we know that because the method might work anyway. Okay, so, Right, so the first topic is what we'll talk about is small cancellation theory. So, in a sense, the, the easiest class of groups in which we can solve the word problem are groups satisfying various small cancellation conditions. And uh, this is, it says, really goes back to Dave, because Dave was working with surface groups, but a more recent look, uh, viewpoint of what he was doing was. The, the, the properties of the surface groups that was making his methods work was the fact that they were actually small cancellation groups. Small cancellation means that roughly that two relators don't have large common subwords. So let's formalize that. So the first thing we have to do in this theory is it's a bit tedious. You, you have to close the relator set under inverses and uh, cyclic shifts, as we call them. And so if you, obviously if you, if a cubed a relator, then a to the minus three is a relator. And almost as obvious if, if a, b, a inverse, b inverse is a relator, then so is b, a inverse, b inverse, a. So it's any shift. So that's a, a nice, a simple example of that. If, if our, so that, that's a, that, that, that's a presentation of the elementary abelian group of order nine. Well, I've written down there, but, with three relators, but if we close it under inverses and cyclic shifts, we get this much bigger set. I've abbreviated A inverses, A bar there. Okay, so what's a piece? So a piece is, is essentially a, a word that's a subword of two different relators, but so meaning two different members of this enlarged set. So so I can write it this way, it, it's, since I've cycled everything, I can say it's a, it's a common prefix of two distinct elements of our hat. So that's, that's what a piece is. And the most basic sort of small cancellation condition, there are various different types, but I'll stick to this, is something called C prime lambda, which, uh, I get, I get confused by the definition. So think of lam lambda as being, um, yeah, so lambda is typically here a, a, a fraction, so something like 1 over 6. So, so, so it satisfies C prime lambda if every piece, if it, so it's a fraction is less than uh, a fraction lambda of the relator. So then, so I've, uh, I've got an example here. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to write this down to start again, so I don't have to. So eight, eight, eight to seven, b to seven, c to seven, d to seven, and I've got it's a product of two commutators, a a plus b plus a b, a b, c plus b plus c d. So if you missed out the the the, the power of seven relators, you get a you get a a surface group, a group of the simple torus. Okay, so, what does it mean? Okay, so, 
Here the pieces are just the, the generators um, and their inverses. And you notice every piece, the, the fraction of the whole word it occupies is less than a sixth. That's why I put seventh powers. If I put sixth powers, this wouldn't work. So because I put seventh powers, the piece A is a seventh of the length of the relator. The seventh is, I believe, mean, less than a sixth. And the other one has got length eight. So this is a nice convenient example because the pieces are all length one. But uh, uh, of course, a lot of a lot of presentations this won't work. So anyway, that satisfies C prime to six. Now, okay, uh, there's another condition which I've written down. I suggest if you don't know what this is already, you don't. I suggest you don't spend time trying to absorb it. So I, I won't explain this. There's another condition T Q. Uh, the way I think about, I I, I find the definition unhelpful. If you, know, if you know what a fan, Kampen diagram for the presentation is, then what, what it says is the vertices in a fan Kampen diagram have valency at least Q. So let's, let's not worry about TQ. I, I just put that in for the statement of this theorem. So th this is, this is due to Linden and Schupp. And it's essentially the, it's the small cancellation analogue of what they did. But there, there was, uh, it was originally about something called Green Liggers who dealt with this. Who, now, Linda the Shop's argument is more geometric. They, they used the, bank, the geometry of bank camp and diagrams. So that's something I'm not really talking about in this, in, in, in this short course. But, uh, any, any element that's, any element that's, in, that's trivial in a, Group presentation, you could build a, a planar diagram where, where the, where, where they the, the, so, I, I mean, it, it, it looks, it, it, look, it looks something like that. Where the, where, where everything is labeled by generators and the, and the relator that you're, um, I got my presentation on that. Uh, and, and the relator that, uh, the, 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 the trivial word of the group is the, is the label of the whole diagram and the internal, internal labels are labelled by um, group relators. So that's a bank of diagram. And a, a lot of the more advanced work on this topic, you, you, you um, use these, di you use curvature of these diagrams to prove the results. So, so that this particular result you can prove by purely what you might call algebraic combinatorial methods and then Greenling did that. It's a bit horrific and when you start using the diagrams because you're, you're actually bringing in a new component here, you're bringing in the geometry of the plane. So you're, uh, which of course a pure algebraist is not so enthusiastic about, but I think it's, I think it's unavoidable but to, to get sort of for deeper results in this topic you need the, pl the planar geometry to and curvature arguments. Anyway, so, let me just write that. I want to keep that present. Uh, and so, uh, it's just, just for a later example, so B to the 7, A inverse, B inverse, A, B, C inverse, B inverse, C, B. Okay, so, now what it says, what the, what the, uh, what they, what this result of Lyndon and Schupp says that, if we satisfy, so just, just contradict on the first part, C prime the sixth, which is saying that all pieces, their length is less than a sixth of the total, the later, then, then we can solve the work problem for G and we can solve it particularly efficiently and we can solve it in linear time using Dane's algorithm. So, now I, now I need to tell you what Dane's algorithm is done. Okay. So, uh, Dane's algorithm, involves rewriting systems, and rewriting systems is going to be one of the main topics of my third talk, so, so we can it's nice we can introduce them at this point. Okay, or rewrite system I call them. Okay, so, what's a rewrite system? Well, it's, it's something you can define outside the context of uh, group theory, it's, it's really something working with words over finite alphabets, so, so they have applications to even to text editing, I believe, and uh, 
So it's about substituting one string for another, so that you efficient methods of doing complicated substitution, string substitutions. So, okay, so what, what is a relaxed -like system? Well, we have a finite set A, the alphabet. And of course, in our context, the alphabet is the set of group generators and their inverses, but for the moment, forget that A is just a finite set, an alphabet A, B, C, D, E. And so a relight -like system is a set of rules, U going to V, where U and V are, are words, A star and then there's a set of all words, so it's like A, B, C goes to D, E or something. And what these rules, so it, what they mean is, the idea is when you see U, a substituting U of a word, then you're allowed to substitute V for U. So that's called applying the rule. So if we have a word in the alphabet and a rule U to V, and we notice that U is a subword of W, then we can apply the rule and replace that U by W. And then we'll get, so this will result in the whole word W being replaced by another word W prime, and then we write W goes to, we think of this as a reduction, you, you think of this as a reduction, in, in principle it doesn't have to be a, any kind of reduction, but that's the way to think of it. Think of it where somehow reducing W goes to W prime, and or more formally, if, uh, S, uh, the, the, we write SVT goes to SWT from all ST and A star. Then we close this uh, arrow relationship up under uh, transitivity and reflexivity. So we say we can derive W prime from W if either W prime is the same as W, so we, that, that's the kind of trivial derivation, or, or we can derive W prime from W by a finite number of applications of these rewrite rules. So this is a set of rewrite rules. Uh, among, I haven't said it's a finite set. So in, in principle, it doesn't have to be a finite set. We could have infinitely many rewrite rules. We could have things like a, a, B to the N, C goes to D to the N for all N. So that, that's, that kind of thing can arise in the group theory. So, but, okay, so, so, so W, the sort of double, double arrow to W prime, these, they could be equal or we could do a finite set of reductions using some of these rules. Yeah, that, so that, that's what, Reduction using a relax system is. Now, now let's go back now. I, I'm going to I'm going to say more about those, the sort of general situation in the next lecture. But for today's purpose, we're in, I'm, I'm supposed to be telling you what a Dane algorithm is. So let's let's just go back to the context of Dane algorithms. So we can, for every group presentation, we can get what's called the Dane presentation out of it. And the way we do that is we split every relator roughly in half. We split relator, so we think, the relator we write as AB, and we think of that as a relation AB inverse, but in this context we want B inverse to be shorter than A, strictly shorter, not just the same length. So for a day rewriting system, all the rules are what we call length reducing. So the left hand side is longer than the right hand side. That's a, that's, that's not true in general, but it's a feature of a day rewriting system. So, so, yeah, so, so, so if we had, if we, if, if we have a rule, if we had a relator like A, B, C, D, E, we, we could rewrite that as A, B, C goes to E inverse, D inverse. Uh, but if, if the rule was A, B, C, D, we'd have to write it as A, B, C goes to D inverse. So, okay, so, so for the day we write, we, yeah, and we do this not just for the given relators, we do it for our closure, our, our hat. So we get a lot of, we end up with a, a big rewrite system. It's finite, but big, because we don't just do it for the given rules, but we, we, we do it for this R hat, which we don't involve closing under inverses and cyclic conjugates. Okay, so, so that's, that's what's called the day rewrite. And we also, we also need to stick in, because, if you like, our rewrite system doesn't know anything about groups. It doesn't, it doesn't know what A inverse means, but 
But that, I mean, that doesn't matter. We can, we, we can teach it what A inverse means. We'll just introduce a rule. A, a times A inverse goes to 1 of all, uh, all generators A. This is enough because you also get A inverse A. Well, yeah, because A is itself closed up inverse. It's a was X union X inverse, so it is enough. I mean, look, yeah. I mean, if, if you're starting with X, you're like in touch with XX inverse and X inverse X. You do need them both, one of them. Otherwise you're, otherwise you're working in a borderlands where the right inverse but not necessarily left inverse. So, I mean, in some sense, this whole um, uh, theory is better expressed in the theory of borderlands rather than groups, because we're, we're, A star is a free borderland. Okay, so then we say that Dane's algorithm solves the world problem for G if for all if when, okay, so if the W being the identity of the group is equivalent to, I'll be able to deduce that W is the identity using our day rewrite system from the presentation. Now, I hope you agree with me that the fact that the right hand side implies the left hand side is clear. That, that's clear in any presentation because the fact that we can deduce, because all our rewrite rules are relations of the group. So every, every rewrite rule we apply, we're preserving equality of the group. Okay, so, but the, the left-hand side implies the right-hand side is not at all clear and it's not normally going to be the case. But, so in the specific case, they now can solve. And so the, what that result of Lyndon and Schupp says that if the group is C prime the sixth, then if that presentation satisfies C prime the sixth, then this indeed holds. There's a, I have, I have got this, there's a slight technicality. Uh, we, we, there's a, there's a, the, 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 it could be that when you, you, you can apply new right rules in different orders, so often there'll be more than one free right rule you could apply. We'll be coming back up to that next time. So for today's algorithm to solve the word problem, we actually Require a slightly stronger condition that if W is the identity, then we could deduce, then we can reduce it to the identity irrespective of the order in which we apply the rewrite rules. That, that's a technicality. Okay. This is, confluence. Uh, this is called confluence on the identity. It's not, it's, it's not confluent altogether. It's, a, it, it, it's only confluent if the word you are is the identity. Yeah. So, yeah, since they're all lecture-reducing, this means we can solve the world problem under the hypotheses of uh, Lyndon and Schock theorem upon small cancellation theorem, we can solve the world problem in linear time using that presentation. So, yeah, here, I mean, here's an example. That's why I wanted to uh, leave this example up. So, so we, ha we, had this, we had this relation A plus B plus <coughs> A, B, C, inverse D, inverse C, D, and that, and a cyclic conjugate of that is starting with A, B, A, B, C, inverse D, inverse C, D, A, inverse B, inverse, and so that gives us a rewrite rule, that, that thing of length 5 reduces the thing of length 3. So this is just a baby example in that case where we, I, I, so that word, we do that substitution, and we end up with and I, I, A cubed beats the seventh, beats the minus seventh, A to the four. And of course, B to the seven and D to the seven were related, so they just collapsed. And, uh, doing it formally, uh, the way we've actually formulated it, we replaced B to the fourth by B to the minus three, which then cancels with the B cube. And so we end up with, then we end up with A to the seven, which, and of course, A to the seven itself reduces. So, so you see, Okay. Uh, a, B, A, B, C, and must D, and must C, D, A, and must Where am I missing C? Uh, uh, so, in the quality, where did the A inverse go? Yeah. So, which, which, which line? So, after you apply the, the A, B, C, D inverse C equals to B, A inverse D inverse, and you collapse the B and D, yeah. where does the A inverse go? Uh, you should have an A or a B and D, right? Between B to the 7th and B to the minus 7th, Derek. 
There's a missing A inverse. I see. Well, it could be this. It, it could be this example is not quite right. But, uh, uh, no, it's a, yeah, but actually, in the original world, there are two C's in which one could be C. Okay, I, 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 that's not right. That's not right. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will, uh, I will correct this example before I make these slides public. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I added that long. I think I added that example of the veil. It's just the beginning of the week, so yes. probably a mistake. Okay, so. This whole situation generalizes, so I'm just, I'm just, the, the rest of this talk is just sort of giving you some full stuff that's around. So we could, we could consider that, so we could say for which class of groups does Dane algorithm solve the word problem for some presentation of that group. So we can't expect it to solve the word problem for any presentation. Typically you'll have to add lots of new relators to get the, the Dane's problem. But we can ask that question, and it turns out that there are it's a very important class of groups. It was introduced by Glomov, and they're known as, well, these days they're, all, they're usually just referred to as hyperbolic groups. When people say hyperbolic groups, they normally, as a, a, an alternative name, word hyperbolic or Glomov hyperbolic. I, I think there was a complication. I, I think some of Glomov's original work, he didn't, he didn't insist that they were finitely generated. So I, I'm just talking about finitely generated in case there's any confusion there. So, and there are lots of equivalent conditions. Well, what, what really makes it clear this is a very fundamental property is there are so many equivalent conditions. So, the first condition, so let, the first condition is that, what I said, there exists a presentation for which Dane Al Dane's algorithm solves the world problem. And an equivalent condition is the Dane function is linear. Well, the Dane function is, well, Okay, okay, I, can, I can tell you quickly what the Dane function is. You, we know that uh, any word that's the identity is the product of conjugates of defining relators. That, that's the definition of normal closure. And so you can say, if, if the word is a length n, then how many defining relators do I, how many products, how many conjugates of defining relators do I need? And if that function is a linear function of n, then that's, Equivalent to the bigger Dane algorithm to solve the word problem. That's another equivalent condition. And the, the most commonly used ones are to do with geodesic triangles in the Cayley graph. And so it's essentially there. You do, it, it's, this is where the hyperbolicity comes. It's a feature of hyperbolic geometry that, uh, that, that geodesic triangles in the Cayley graph are thin, uniformly thin, meaning any, any point on one side is within a bounded distance from a point on one of the other two sides. And they arise frequently from the actions of groups on the hyperbolic space and so on, hyperbolic manifolds and so on. There are, there are other conditions about uh, exponential divergence of geodesics and so on. Okay, so that's hyperbolic. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, so now, a little bit about software here. There's a, which I should mention briefly, there's a, a, there's a very, so can we sort of prove computationally that the group's hyperbolic and can we do this in practice? I'm, I'm talking about algorithms in group theory. So the answer is yes, to some extent. So this, this is fairly recent work. Well, I don't know. Some sense it's not recent. It's, it's recent. The implementations of the sort of final versions are recent. This is, a project originally due to Richard Parker. It started a long time ago. And there are a huge number of people involved, I suppose, including myself. I haven't put myself in the list there because I, my, I think my contribution was to help, help light it up, which um, they, were, they were getting desperate because Richard Parker never writes anything, never writes anything down. And, uh, well, Max, Max Neuberger was doing a good job of this, but then he left, left unfortunately. I don't know whether it was a count or account of this project, but he left. Anyway. So he, he was no longer available to write this stuff up. Anyway, so, so there, are, there, there are procedures in Magma and Gap which do this, and but they, 
they generalize this. They, they won't work on all the groups sat satisfying the hypotheses of the Linden and Schutz theorem. They will work slightly more generally because one of the disadvantages of the small constellation theory is that if, 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 you've got relation, if you've got relations like a squared, b cubed, and so on, which are very common in presentations, then they kill the small constellation dead before you've even started. If you've got a relation like b cubed, well, actually, a squared you could deal with to some extent, but you could just think of a as b equal to its inverse. So, so you, but if you've got a relation like b cubed, then you've got then if b occurs in any other relation at all, so if b, if b doesn't occur in any other relation, you've got a free product. But if b occurs in some other relation, then it's going to be a piece. So you've got a piece which is a th only a third of the length. So if you've got any power relations which are less than a seventh power, then you, the small cancellation has that hope of working. But there's a, there's, there's a nice generalization uh, where you divide what's, the thing into what's called green relations and red relations. So the red relations are the, these, typically these power relations, and the green ones are the others. And that, so that, that enables it to work in the presence of, if you're lucky, in the presence of. It, do, it doesn't appear to work on all hyperbolic groups, although this is the current implementations of what I call version 1, and it's, hope, hope, it's hoping there will be versions 2, 3, 4, which will be much more powerful. The, the advantage when it does work, it works absolutely instantly, and, it, and you can apply the data algorithm and actually do the reduction. There's, a, there's an alternative better than working with uh, hyperbolic groups, which is going to be the topic of my next lecture, the third lecture. And this can, this can prove that a group is hyperbolic, uh, but it, typically it will be much, it, in theory that will work on all hyperbolic groups, but uh, again you're bounded by it. And it. But it's typically much slower, and it, it comes up with the solution of the word problem, but it's not, it doesn't come up with a vain presentation, it comes up with a quadratic time solution. So KBMAC works on more examples, but it's much slower. Yeah, I think that's... I think that's it for today. <laughs>
you will hear your name and you will need to indicate that you are taking food that's given to you. It's also, you will be able to pay by yourself German restaurants will notoriously able to handle 50 different bills without any difficulty. You're not able to handle 50 different orders, but you're able to handle 50 different bills. I know that there are tables both inside and outside. And quite what the arrangement of tables is, I don't know. So turn up and grab a place. If you don't know where the restaurant is, it's called Roses. There is a map, there are a number of maps on the table where you register, which will indicate the location of the restaurant. But I'm afraid we regard them as adults, so therefore we expect that you can manage to get there all by yourselves. It's a walking distance. Yeah. It's very close to the railway station. It's a few blocks the other side of the railway station. That's the broad information. Also, if you have more questions on the touristic possibilities, ask me. If you want to run to Drachenfels, look at the whiteboard. And uh, thanks, Derek, to the nice, quite a nice second lecture.